All right, so this is Dr. Morton, and I'm going to uh, cover um, the, uh, I think it's the, uh, I think it's the 11th, the 10th uh, micro lecture. I believe that's right. And uh, let's just take a quick look at the syllabus, and we'll talk about what we're going to go over. So, and I'm, I'll shrink this down a little bit. Okay. So, um, so first we're gonna we'll talk about um, so here we are on the first first of October hard to believe the en the end of uh, I think it's the fifth week yeah so we're gonna do a little review for the written test uh, I may talk about the photoresistor just a little bit I may I may push that back homework four is due tonight uh, I might pull that up and say a few things about that and then I will talk about the lab so we'll see how much of that we get covered. Um, Let's see, maybe I'll talk about the lab first. Um, so, yeah. So here's the lab. And uh, this is the, the sheet. If we go to the website, uh, if we go to, uh, so, so we have starter code and uh, this PDF file. So let's first look at the PDF file. Okay, and I'm gonna, Move this up here. So we're going to use uh, we're going to use your Snap Programmer, uh, but we're going to add one additional piece of uh, equipment. Uh, you need to have the analog board, and uh, that board. Let's see. I'll show you one. Um, yeah, let me do that real quick. Uh, let's see. I have to put this in. And. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see if that comes up. Uh, so here we go. Yeah, I know. Switch the cameras. I think that should come up. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is the analog board here. And what I want you to see is that this analog board, it plugs in to, to the analog header. This is your programming header where your, uh, where your uh, snap plugs in. And it just fits nicely underneath that. And here's your there's your analog header. And so you can uh, uh, let's see. I'll turn on a little light. Maybe it'll be easier to see. Yeah. So um, yeah. So so the analog header has three features on it. It has a uh, 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 I think it's an MC ninety seven hundred which is a temperature sensor. It has a potentiometer and it has a photoresistor. And you can see those three devices right there. The potentiometer is glued on so it doesn't won't wiggle. It's also soldered on. And, and it's a five pin header. The first two pins are ground and power and then the output from, and they're all listed, I have to look at them though, uh, the output from the temperature sensor the output from the photoresistor, and finally the output from the pot. And so, and if you look down on your board, you see right down there, th these are listed, uh, and you can should be able to see it, RC2AN6, RC3AN7, and RB5AN11, and of course ground and power. So those are the five pins in that header. All, all three of the, of the port pins uh, that go to the chip are pins that um, have analog input features. And so for them to work, you must leave the ANCEL register uh, uh, with the bit, those, that corresponding bit set. Now in this particular lab, we're, we're not going to use, we're not going to use the, uh, um, the, the temperature sensor and we're not going to use the photoresistor. But try and, try and make sure that you don't output a signal on any of the, on on those RC2 and RC3 pins because uh, that could theoretically screw things up so we don't want to do that but the pin we are going to use is that last one RB5 we are going to use that and uh, and so just take your board and plug it in if you don't have one I'll make sure we have boards in the lab on Friday you can swing by and pick one up for all you that are at home I did mail that out so everybody that got stuff mailed to them uh, with the exception of the person that just got a snap mailed 
everybody else uh, should have everything. And most of you, when you uh, picked up your, when you uh, paid for your Viva board, uh, if you did that at, at school, then we, we threw in the analog board uh, and it's a loaner and as is the uh, CR212 and the cable. So the, for those of the, you who picked it up at UTSA, those are loaners and I do want you to turn those back in at the end. Uh, for those of you that got it through eBay, I, I just kind of threw that into the package so that you don't have to turn those back in. Of course, if you'd like to, I, that'd be great. Uh, uh, the, the whole package you got uh, was still way cheaper than, than well, just the just snap is uh, 24 bucks. Uh, so, and I think we charge you 18 plus shipping. So anyway, uh, so if you want to turn it back in, great. But from everybody else, I do want to get these boards back at the end of the semester. Okay, let me switch this back. And, um, and then, okay. So the main purpose of this lab is to introduce you to the concept of PWM and its various uses. Uh, I probably should talk about PWM a little bit. Maybe I'll try and squeeze that into. We'll see, that's probably more than we can do. But you're also gonna use the A to D converter in this lab as well, because that's what the, you, you have to use that to, for the pot to be useful. And all the pot is, it's a potentiometer. One end of it, one end of the, of the resistor is connected to ground. The other end's connected to VDD and the wiper is connected to RB5 slash analog input 11. Now, the, the numbering for the analog inputs has nothing to do with the RB5, with the, with the, uh, the port designations. Uh, so let's look at that real quick so you understand why that is. So if we go, if we go up to the very top of the data sheet, not the top top, uh, and we scroll down here, you'll see when we get to the, the footprint, it, it's like page, uh, four or five. Here's the 20 pin output and here's the 20 pin allocation table. And that's what we have. We have a 20 pin chip and um, it's the 16F1829. Notice over here, this is our uh, 20 pin uh, uh, SOIC. That's what we have is the SOIC. Uh, and here are the pin numbers. And notice uh, here, the, here, the, here, the, here are the port numbers. And here are the analog numbers. So notice here, RA0 is AN0, RA1 is AN1, RA2 is AN2, RA4 is AN3, RB4 is AN10, RB5 is AN11, RC0 is AN4. So the numbers don't really correlate with, they don't, they don't make, they do make sense if you understand that that they're, they're really numbered for the 14 pin chip that doesn't have a port B. That's why all the port Bs, uh, the two port B analog inputs are left. Now notice, there's no analog input on RA3. Well, that's the master clear pin. There's also no analog input on RA5. There's none on RA, RB6, there's none on RB7, and there's none on RC4 and 5, and, but all the other Cs, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, and 6 and 7 do have analog inputs. So when you go to the AND cell, the ANCEL registers for each of the ports, only those pins that have an analog function uh, will have an analog an ANCEL bit in that position, and then the other bit positions are not implemented. But all those all those bits are by default on reset and power up are set automatically to the value of one, which means analog function. So as long as you don't change it to a zero by clearing that register or changing that or, or clearing that bit, everything will be fine. So make sure that you uh, make sure that you don't uh, clear the bit for an analog input you want to use. So in this case, uh, RB5, our bit five in the N cell B register must be set, and in the Tris B register, bit five also must be set. If they're not, then you're not that analog input's not going to work. And uh, and it'll be set for digital, and you also, or if you set it for output, then whatever, then the output of the of the flip flop is going to swamp the input of the analog value and cause problems. Okay, um, yeah. The other thing you should do is you should go down to uh, the uh, the uh, the CCP registers, which are right here. It stands for Capture, Compare, and PWM. Now, uh, these registers can function. In capture mode, they can also function in compare mode, 
and they can function in PWM. We're going to use them in PWM. There are four registers. ECCP1, which stands for Enhanced CCP1, Enhanced CCP2, and then CCP3 and CCP4. The way we're going to use them as single-ended PWM outputs, they all work exactly the same. But the in, two enhanced, enhanced one can, can be set up with four outputs for its PWM signal to, so that it can generate a, a, a full bridge. And ECCP2, its enhanced feature allows it to set up as a half bridge. So the full bridge means you can reverse your motor and the half bridge means you, you can't reverse it, but you can, you can PWM the motor. Whereas a standard single PWM signal, then uh, you would have to provide your own uh, motor controller, which you would then drive with your, CC, with your, with your PWM signal. Um, so um, most of the, most of the, uh, of the uh, motor controller uh, are, are able to be set up to be controlled with PWM. And that's really nice because uh, this, this allows us to adjust the uh, speed of the motor over a very wide range. Uh, otherwise, the motor's just on or off. And, uh, and so, but motors are not the only thing you can control with PWM. You can also control things like uh, space heaters, LEDs, uh, even incandescent lights, really. You, you have a lot of control over things. And what's really nice about PWM, it allows you to, uh, it allows you to control the amount of power delivered to nonlinear devices. Now, normally, kind of in the old days, the way we controlled the power delivered, we just varied the voltage. PWM does not work that way. PWM works on a percent duty cycle model, which means that at any given moment, the voltage to your controlled device is either fully on or it's fully off. But that we're doing that at, at a pulse repetition rate that can vary anywhere from maybe 50 cycles per second to maybe uh, you know uh, 20,000 or more cycles per second. And it depends on what the device is, um, what, what's, what the optimum frequency. It could, be, it could even go higher than that, but those are kind of the typical working ranges. In, in our case, we're going to vary the, the power delivered to an LED. Now, why would we want to use PWM to do that? Well, the reason is that, that a, a, an LED, if you change the voltage to an LED, here's what happens to the LED, and you can try this yourself. Uh, as, you, as you start off in your voltage, let's say you're doing this with a, uh, say a, a, a red LED. So a red LED has a, has a, uh, has a, a voltage drop across it, of, uh, of about 1.4 or 5 volts, well, maybe 1.6. So, so as you turn up your voltage, until you get to something over 1 volt, you won't see anything in the LED. It won't be on. When you finally get that voltage uh, over the, the, the voltage drop across that, that LED, it'll turn on. Now, initially, if you're just a little bit ab above that voltage drop, there won't be much current flowing through it. And so... Uh, assuming you have a current linear resistor in the circuit as well. And so, so that it will not shine at its maximum brightness. Most LEDs, uh, the standard LEDs, are set to be maximum brightness somewhere around 20 milliamps or a little less. Some of the really super bright LEDs and some used for, for high intensity lighting operate with much higher currents because there, there are many more LEDs in each little module, basically. In any event, uh, but for a typical LED like we're going to use in, in Micro One, you're looking to drive it with something, you know, 18, 20 milliamps. Uh, so we calculate the voltage drop. We subtract it from your drive voltage, and then we calculate uh, what sort of resistor we would need to, uh, 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 to, to give us a 20 milliamp current through the resistor with the remaining voltage drop. So, for instance, let's say your voltage drop across a red LED is 1.5 volts and you're running, say, at 5 volts. So then you take 1.5 from 5, so that leaves you 3.5 volts. And so you know you need to drop, uh, you're going to drop 3.5 volts across your current limiting resistor. So what resistance would you need with a voltage drop of 3.5 volts to give you a 20 milliamp current? And that's how you calculate that. Um, 
where i equals uh, uh, e over r. So you just divide the voltage by the resistance and that tells you how many milliamps. Uh, and you adjust that till your milliamps read uh, 20. Or your resistance then uh, would equal uh, E divided by the current. Or E divided by 20 milliamps. All right, so anyway, uh, as you keep turning up the voltage to this LED, once you've selected the proper current limiting resistor, you'll see it does get a little bit brighter. And then before very long, it gets almost to its normal brightness. And then as you continue to increase the voltage, which means you're giving it more and more current, uh, it really doesn't get a whole lot brighter. It just starts to get hotter. And eventually, if you let enough current run through it, you'll burn it out. You'll degrade it. If it's, if it's not so much to just burn it out, you'll, you'll just slowly degrade it. And over time, it'll kind of dim down. Or if you just give it a real blast of voltage uh, so that it has a real high current, uh, many of these LEDs will, will just burn out. Some will burn out instantly. Some do take a little more time to burn out. Some don't actually burn out. They just kind of fade. And, they, and then from then on, they, they're very dim. Uh, they have kind of different characteristics depending on how they're made. Um, okay, so, so what that basically says is that although you can get some variation in your LED brightness by changing the voltage that you're uh, driving the LED and its current limiting resistor with, your ability to, to do this is, is limited because the, the, the response of the circuit is very nonlinear. Uh, so if you want to deliver, if you want to have a nice linear control over the power delivered to the LED or the brightness of the LED, then a better way to do it is to turn it on and off at a fast enough rate uh, that your eyes fuse the blinking so it appears like it's continually on but uh, not so fast that the LED has time to fully turn off and fully turn back on. So typically something in the neighborhood of a, of a few kilohertz frequency range. So, so a few thousand times a second, you turn it on and then you leave it on for part of that, 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 that say, say we're doing a one kilohertz. So every thousandth of a second, you turn it on for some percentage of, of of the of that of that uh, uh, of that millisecond, and if you leave it on for the whole millisecond, then it's just fully on. If you leave it off for the whole millisecond, then it'll just be completely off. But if you leave it on for half of that millisecond and the other half of that millisecond it's off, then you should see it at about 50% of its brightness, uh, because you're delivering 50% of the power. And that's, that's called our duty cycle, the percent of time in that, say, whatever your pulse interval is. So there's two features of PWM, the pulse interval and the percentage of time during the pulse interval that your signal is on. Now there's other features uh, that come to bear on PWM signals, but we're not gonna talk about those right now. We'll deal with those later in the course when I talk about PWM. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to vary the duty cycle. Now remember the the voltage that's being output in the circuit is either if you're running your chip at five volts it's either five volts or it's zero volts. If you're running your chip at three point three it's either three point three volts or it's zero volts. And you can you can change your jumper and play with it and see see uh, you'll probably get a a little nicer linear response if you run it at five volts. But in any event. Uh, you don't change the voltage. You just change the amount of time during our, say we're using a one kilohertz frequency, you change the amount of time during that, that one millisecond period that, that the output is at five volts. And uh, if it's 100% of the time, then it's fully on. If it's 0% of the time, it's fully off. If it's 25% of the time, it should be about 25% of brightness. Because during that 25%, the output is five volts. But then the other 75%, the out volt of that pin is zero volts. And then that repeats every millisecond over and over again. Now our actual pulse repetition period is, is it, it's not a millisecond. I, I actually don't know off the top of my head, I don't remember. But, it, but it's, a, it's some other value, a little bit arbitrary. Uh, but you can play with the uh, various parameters in the PWM module and in your system clock. And you can, 
you can pick this period to be kind of whatever you want. We're, we're going to stick with a system clock of 4 megahertz, so that does kind of constrain, uh, uh, you know, what our period will be. And, and then there are other things like uh, how many bits of rev resolution you have over your ability to adjust that, that duty cycle. Do you, you know, can you adjust the duty cycle with 8 bits of precision or 10 bits of precision or just 3 or 4 bits of precision? In, in our case, the P, these PWM modules do have 10 bits of precision theoretically, but that depends on you setting everything up correctly to actually get that 10 bits. Okay, and I'm not going to go into that in any more detail. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, then, all right, so let's back to the lab. Um, yeah, so let me put this back up, and then what I'm going to do is go back to the lab. Yeah, so, all right, so you should read through this sheet. I'm not going to do all that. You are going to be using, you're going to be plugging in your analog board like I showed you, and the pot's going to go in on AN11. Now, your potentiometer and the photoresistor, uh, sorry, the photoresistor and the temperature sensor are still going to be, they're going to be connected because when you plug in the board, you plug in everything. You could only plug in the parts of the board uh, with jumper wires if that's what you wanted to do, but the whole reason that I made these boards was because when we just had pots with wires, so many students would plug them in wrong and burn them up uh, that I gave up. Uh, and we would have a whole box of uh, potentiometers uh, and only one or two out of the whole box would work because students would plug them in wrong and burn them up. And it's easy to burn them up because if you plug in the wiper to uh, ground and then you plug one end into uh, VDD and you plug the other end into the sensor, input, as you move the wiper closer and closer to VDD, the resistance that's left gets smaller and smaller, and finally that resistance is so small that, that, that the last you know, few ohms of resistance just conducts so much current it, it destroys the potentiometer at that little part, which means the potentiometer doesn't work anymore. So anyway, so that's why I made the board. So plug the board in just like I showed you. It's kind of hard to plug it in wrong. Uh, if you try and plug it in wrong, you'll bump into your switch and you'll you'll be covering up your other inputs. And so, so again, just to review this, uh, you want to plug it in so it looks like that. You want it sticking out along uh, over the top of your snap. You don't want it covering up UTSA or bumping into your switch. Okay? All right. Now... All right, so, and then as we continue to uh, scan through this, um, uh, let's see, I, I'm not going to look at the starter code. There may be, let me, well, let me look at the starter code real quick. There probably are mistakes in it. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll try and fix those tonight. Okay, lab five. Lab five, and then here's the starter code. All right, so configuration words, and then we're going to set up. Uh, we're going to use the APFCon register, and all this does that that changes the PWM uh, the PWM output for one of the PWM modules to go to pin 5 instead of uh, one of the pins in the, C, in the R, R, to pin RA5 instead of one of the pins in the uh, C port, port C. Um, so you have to make sure you set that, otherwise you won't be controlling your green LED. You'll be controlling another pin that you won't see. And then, um, yeah, so we're going to use, uh, we're going to use about a megahertz. Uh, I'm sorry, about, yeah, no, I mean about one kilohertz. So 1000 hertz uh, for our frequency our pulse repetition frequency. And then we're going to enable the module with these control registers. And you need to read about this in the data sheet. And, uh, and then we also have to set up timer uh, 2 control register because we're going to use timer 2 to control this. 
with a one to one post scaler, but a four to one pre scaler. Uh, and that'll that'll get us the, the values we need to get this one roughly about a about a one kilohertz uh, frequency. And then we do have a duty cycle register. Uh, now one goofy thing to the so remember I said this is a 10 bit uh, has 10 bits of resolution. Well, you should remember that um, that our chip uh, is an 8 bit chip. So the way we get 10 bits of resolution, we have to use two different uh, two different registers to get it. One register is the duty cycle register. It's not called that, but that's what it is. It's it's called CPR uh, CCPR2L, uh, um, and that's because these registers are used for for the compare and the capture functions as well. So they kind of got funny names. But in the in one of the control registers, the ninth and tenth bits, so bit eight and nine, are actually in the middle of that control register, which makes it kind of awkward. So, so usually we just, unless we really do need all 10 bits, we just kind of ignore this and, uh, and leave that set to zero. And, and we really only have eight bits of resolution, which is generally more than we need for what we're doing. Um, and so the other thing, it, it, we set up several different functions. Now let's see, I want to make sure that the that the ADC is set up correctly. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. This is this is this is wrong, but in the code in the uh, in the lab, I did make it correct. So let's let's go to that. So if you look at the code in the in in the data sheet, a, your ADC. So this is your initialize your analog to digital converter. We're, we're not going to really teach you all about the entity converter in this lab. You're just going to use it. We're going to spoon feed it to you. But later on, we're going to come back and cover this in detail. For this lab, focus on the PWM part. But you are going to use the ADC part, so you got to get it right or it won't work. This is what you need to put in there. Uh, 0010101, 01, which is uh, hex 2D. Uh, hex 2D. So if we go back to the data sheet here. We want hex 2D and I'm going to just do that. So 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. So that's what we need. And, uh, and then I'm going to save this and hopefully uh, we'll put this, I'll put this back up on the web. Let me, I'm going to pause it. Okay, so I cleaned up the starter code to reflect uh, the that the analog input is going to be on AN11 RB5, and I also fixed the the constraint word was set to uh, low voltage programming off, which we don't want. We want it on, so I fixed those two things. So hopefully nobody will get screwed up on it. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to drop out of this, and let's see. So I'm going to do this. And yeah, all right. So, so now let me talk a little bit about. I think that's all I'm going to say about the lab. Um, I think the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory, and hopefully you guys will really enjoy it. Uh, you should have uh, should have a lot of fun with this lab. You'll be able to change the intensity of your LED with your pot. Uh, it's very cool. It, uh, so it's going to use the uh, it's going to use the setting on the pot, which is going to vary. the The pot's a ten bit pot, and we have 10 bits of A to D conversion, so it's it's going to take the pot reading and it's going to put uh, it's going to put the uh, the upper eight bits in the duty cycle register and the lower lower two bits it's going to put in the middle of uh, for the lower two bits that are in the middle of that uh, 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 control register. So as you turn the pot, you should see the brightness of your LED and you should see it change nice and smoothly. Um, you should see you should be able to get it very very dim and all the way to maximum brightness and what this does this allows you to have a, a pretty much deliver deliver a linear range of power to a nonlinear device and that's one of the powers of PWM uh, PWM's all it's used extensively for controlling many things many things that are not linear uh, you all didn't grow up in the era uh, of, uh, of, of when electric drills sort of just became available. But believe it or not, we haven't always had 
uh, these battery-operated handheld electric drills. These are relatively new things. And uh, one of the features of our old electric drills, which, again, didn't run on batteries. They all were plugged into the wall. You had a trigger on that drill. That drill either was full-on, maximum power, or it was full off. You couldn't control the amount of power that that drill has. And of course, now uh, we have, oh, I don't, oh, I do have it. So if I just take my standard, my standard old little handheld DeWalt, uh, and you can see I can have it run very slow or very fast. and. The only way to get it to run this slow, if you just if you did that without using PWM, the motor would stall at some voltage setting. The motor would never would just not work. It would just sit there and stall and get warm up a little bit. The only way this works is is to always deliver full power to the motor, but change the percent of the duty of the duty cycle that the power is fully on. And, the, and then the rest of the percent of time, of course, it's fully off. So if you have a 1% duty cycle, 1% of your pulse period, you're, you're giving it full power, but for the other 99%, it's off. And that's how we can still get a little teeny impulses to make the motor run at this very slow speed, which is nice because it gives you fine control when you're trying to drive a, a, you know, a screw into your deck or whatever you're doing with it. In the old days, we didn't first they weren't battery operated and secondly they were plugged into the wall and secondly you were either fully on or fully off we didn't have electronic controls but that device has electronic controls and how do i know that because i dropped one into the swimming pool and it's never worked again in the old days with a motor you can drop motors into stuff as long as, as long as they don't burn up let them dry out they'll work fine but if you blow your your digital circuitry because you have little, uh, you have little fine pitch chips in there, and you get a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, crystallization across the the pin, and uh, and it blows the chip, then it's never going to work again, no matter what you do to it. Anyway, so just a little anecdote. Okay, so let's talk about this. So um, this is so this is the upcoming written test. I think it's it's not next week, it's the week after. So you've got a little bit of a break here, but I do want you to be thinking about it. Now this is just going to be a, a standard written test. There are some practice tests on the web, uh, which maybe I'll look at once we go through this. Uh, I'll talk about those two, and, and I'll probably do some more review before we actually get to it. But I wanted to cover this today. All right, so here's what I want you to know. So I want you to know uh, the difference between a microcontroller and a microcomputer, okay? A microcomputer, that's your desktop or laptop. It, that chip is a very powerful processor, but it doesn't have any built-in modules. It doesn't have an A to D module. doesn't have PWM modules. doesn't have timers. doesn't have, well, it has a, it has a system clock module uh, that's built in, but it doesn't have anything else. And, and uh, it, it, doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have touch sensing module. It doesn't have peripheral pins. It doesn't have any of that. It, all it does is has a bus for memory, and uh, and and it well it has a PCI bus to control peripheral devices. That PCI bus, uh, because it uh, it's driven because your 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 Intel or AMD chip is still running on the old IA32 opera, uh, instruction set uh, with a few upgrades, uh, and the IA32 was not memory mapped, so it had specific instructions just for I/O. And that's where the PCI PCI bus is driven, and they they've also added in built-in math coprocessors and and then uh, you know and, and then graphics cards and all this. But so you have to have all this supporting stuff. There's no there's there's a little bit of cash on your on your big AMD and and Intel chips, but the vast majority of your you know eight gigabytes or however much memory you have, it's in dynamic RAM. And the dynamic RAM is hosted on this motherboard, and you plug in little little uh, you know little uh, cards with uh, you know four or eight or sixteen gigabytes on it or whatever you get, and then that RAM has to be refreshed 
because it's dynamic RAM. So you have to have a motherboard that supports the dynamic RAM and then has the bus connections to your chip. And nowadays, uh, there's probably uh, there's probably 32 bits of control line of, of address lines uh, and uh, 32 bits of data lines because we or maybe even 64 bits because we have 64 bit systems now. And uh, so with a microcontroller, you don't have any of that. Uh, well, you you do have you have all of that, but you have it all built into the chip. So the RAM is built into your chip. The program memory is built into your chip, uh, and it's usually flash. You have all these peripheral modules that do all sorts of things, so you don't have to plug cards in. Uh, you might have to interface something to it, but you're going to use a built-in module for, say, I2C squared interface. And, and there's just all this capability built into the chip. And normally when you program this micro microcontroller, you're going to program it with a, by flashing in your program, and once you program it, you're going to probably put it in a product, ship it out to the field, and it's going to be used for most of its lifetime. Maybe it'll never be upgraded. It'll run that same code for its entire useful life. Whereas your desktop or laptop, not only do you upgrade the operating system, but every day, every few minutes, you're adding and uh, you're adding new and, and deleting old uh, or various uh, applications that you're using or not using. So your software is continually changing. And that's why we don't call it firmware. In a microcontroller, we call it firmware because it's it's built in. And it's usually flash in the ROM and it's not going to change. So um, so you should you should definitely know you should definitely know uh, the difference. You should know that a typical microcomputer has a has displays, it has keyboards, mice, uh, you can plug in all sorts of stuff, it has lots of USB ports. Um, your microcontroller probably doesn't have any of that stuff. Uh, and if you want to have a human interface, you may, may use a push button. You might use a two line by 16 LCD display to display data. Uh, you could use a little OLED display. And if you really you know, wanted to get fancy, you could make a, a bigger display. You could set up, uh, you know, your desktop has wireless, Bluetooth, Ethernet. Uh, your microcontroller might have some of that, but uh, but again, it's all built in. It's built into the chip. You don't have to add on modules to get that functionality. Um, okay, so so there's a lot of distinctions, but uh, the you should know about the programmer's model for the PIC. You, so in the registers you need to know, you need to know the program counter low, the program counter latch high, the bank select register, the W register, uh, the status register. And then there's a bunch of indirect registers. Um, and I think that's it. So, but I don't care about the indirect register. I'm not going to ask you about those. I'm just going to ask you about the ones I mentioned. So you should know the programmer's model. Architecture. So you should know that our chip is a Harvard architecture chip, not a von Neumann. It's Harvard. In von Neumann, everything's in the same address space. You have one data bus, you have one address bus. Your address bus could be 32 bits. It could be even bigger than that. Your data bus could be uh, uh, 64 bits. In our case, we have the Harvard architecture. So we have a completely separate uh, pr bus for our program memory, which our data bus for the program memory happens to be uh, happens to be uh, 14 bits wide, because every instruction is 14 bits, and our address bus for our program memory is 15 bits, because we can have up to 32k of program memory in this family of chips. In the on the data side, the special function registers and the data uh, and the the random access memory locations. The data bus is 8 bits wide, and the address bus for that is 12 bits. So both the address bus and the data buses are different size for program memory and for data memory. And that's Harvard architecture. Now what's nice is when you have these separate buses and address buses and data buses, you can be loading programs at the same time you're moving data around. Or you can, you can be loading instructions 
the same time you're moving data around. So that, that does maybe give you a slight speed advantage. Uh, and uh, there, there, are still, uh, there are a lot of chips today. Many are made with von Neumann architecture. Many are made with Harvard. Um, so our memory organization in this chip, uh, again, is because it's a Harvard chip. So our program memory is flash. It's, it's, it's flash read-only memory. But our data memory is random access and the special function registers for all the modules are there too in our ports. Our memory is, is organized uh, in a couple different ways. If you're using indirect addressing, then, uh, then part of the indirect addressing is just a linear continuous address space. But if you're, using, if you're not using indirect addressing, then if you're using direct addressing, then our memory is divided into 32 banks. And you have to have the BSR, the bank select register, pointing to the right bank. The upper five bits of the 12-bit address for our data memory is in the BSR, and the lower seven bits of the address is embedded in the instruction, whichever instruction you happen to be executing at the time. And that's why we have to do bank cells and all that. Now, if you use indirect addressing, you don't have to do bank cells, but you do have to initialize your indirect registers and get them pointing to the right stuff. Um, all right, support requirements. These chips uh, are very uh, are very robust. You can make you can build a very Spartan board and fire up one of these chips and have it running with very little support hardware. And that's really nice when you when you want to uh, do an embedded application and you you want to have the minimum amount of hardware, like you you want it to be super small. Um, I do have I, I have I have bought some of these chips in some of their teeny tiny form sizes, and they literally can get down to the size of uh, of you know I don't know something much smaller than uh, than the characters on the screen, uh, you know like more like uh, yeah this you can see the colon here after overview of review, you can get you can get our chip in in a size it's. Potentially, I think, even smaller than this. Uh, I, I think I have some that are actually about half that size. So, and and you can go even smaller if you want to. If you want to buy uh, the actual die and and put on your own bonding wires, you can go down smaller than that. So these can get extremely small. Uh, whereas uh, the AMD chip, well, first off, you have to have a, a big fan and a cooler <laughs> that is just gargantuan. I mean, you've seen it. You've looked in your motherboards, uh, in your uh, desktops and laptops, and you you see these chips are big, you know, and they have uh, a lot of hardware mounted on them to keep them cool. Because if they if you don't run that, uh, they'll overheat and burn up, especially if you try and um, you know run them faster than they're designed to be run. So there's a lot of support requirements. Your desktop has to has to provide all the support for your dynamic random access memory. That's why you can have, you know, gigabytes. It's hard to have gigabytes on a micro because it's static RAM. Static RAM takes up a lot more room. Um, so your motherboard has to have extra circuitry on it to support the dynamic RAM because it has to be refreshed. Uh, I don't know how fast, but I mean at microsecond levels at least. Uh, well, millisecond levels for sure. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe down into microsecond levels. So there's a lot of support requirements. Your uh, drivers for your disk drive, your graphics card, uh, your uh, uh, the keyboard and the mouse, uh, all that stuff has to be provided to the chip. So a lot more support. Right, but this chip doesn't can has a lot of built-in stuff, so it can do a lot with nothing supporting it. Um, and then programming. So you should know a little bit about the integrated development environment. You should know, you, you, we've covered the instruction set, so you, you should know the native instruction set. Not memorized, but you should, you should have a working knowledge of the important instructions and uh, be able to look up the ones you don't know. You should know how to program it in MPASM and in C. You should know about the configuration words. And then you should know some of the peripheral functions. Obviously, we haven't covered them all yet, but uh, the ones we have covered, uh, the uh, GPIO pins, timers, PWM module, uh, you should know about those. And you should know a little bit about 
what what you have to think about when you're hooking up to other chips. Um, so your microprocessor is is functionally a uh, a little computer on a single chip, basically. And it has the processor core, it has memory, it has programmable input and output peripherals, and a whole bunch of stuff. That's from Wikipedia. Uh, the reason why it's set up like that is, is to allow you to use it in, in embedded designs with very little additional support circuitry. Whereas if you wanted to use uh, make a device and have your something like your laptop controlling it, what a waste. You know, do you really need the screen? Do you really need a mouse? Do you really need, uh, you know, a wired Ethernet port? Probably not, right? So, uh, so that's why microprocessors are, are out there. They're to, they're, they're, to, they're to give us the ability to design these embedded controllers. Like your car. Your car has about maybe 40 microprocessors in it. It doesn't, it, it doesn't need microcomputers. That would just, can you imagine the equivalent of 40 laptops? Uh, you know, built into your car. Ridiculous, right? You don't need that. You just need the functionality of the CPU and a, and a few supporting uh, modules. So, and one of the upshots of this is because we're, we're embedding more and more of these things in more and more products, eventually every product, almost everything, is going to have uh, a microprocessor in it. I mean, even now, most of the children's toys that do anything have a little microprocessor in them. Uh, just to give them some cute functionality. And what's really nice is when you when you put these things in, they give you a lot of uh, additional capability, a tremendous amount, to, to clean up your interface, to, to add all sorts of features, diagnostics. You can even set it up so it talks to the, to the local area and at, in the house, wherever the appliance is installed, and, uh, and does, uh, you know, self-checks on the, on the appliance, and then... Uh, sends notifications to the company when the appliance might need maintenance and schedules it and sends a notification to the customer telling them that a maintenance person is going to come in a week and uh, fix the, the washing machine that's about ready to break, even though they don't know. Um, so here was one of, this is one of the earlier Viva boards, uh, not the first. We've, we've been, we're up to, we're up to 4.3. Uh, I think this is 2 point something. I actually don't know. Um, Anyway, uh, we used the we used a, uh, a a dip version of the same chip. Your chip is is about half this size, or maybe even less. Um, the reason I picked this uh, is an, an instead of just a single LED, we now have an RGB LED, which is nice. Um, and instead of just uh, one voltage regulator, we have two and. Uh, and then we, we used to have all these headers, but we didn't really use these headers. They were a lot to solder on. Uh, and then I had two single row tens you had to kind of put together. Now I've got a, uh, a double row 10 that you, can, that you solder on. Uh, but a lot of the other things were very similar. Um, we, we kind of pared down the headers. So we just have the analog header and the header for the CR2102 uh, US, uh, URTTL level signals to USB interface. And we will be using that extensively starting maybe next week for the rest of the from pretty much every other lab. And you'll find that you'll really like being able to talk to your laptop or desktop. Um, all right. So uh, again, here's the programmer programmer's model. But you don't have to. I don't care that you memorize all these. What I want you to know is the program counter low, program counter latch high, the status, the BSR, and the W. Those five key registers. These other ones are just indirect addressing registers, and really, it's just the the global reference for the two for the low and high zero bytes IDF zero and uh, the IDF one for the low and high uh, FSR one and FS uh, FSR one L and FSR one H, uh, yeah, low and high registers. Okay, so <clears throat> the these. These registers make up the first 12 in every memory bank. And again, they're 32 memory banks. And the BSR is, is what selects those when you use direct addressing. If you use indirect addressing, then you don't have to worry about the BSR. It doesn't use the BSR. OK, um, so again, here's our programmer's model. 
you need to know the W, the BSR. Notice BSR only has five bits. The W register has eight bits. The program counter low has eight bits of the, for the low byte, least significant byte. But the PC latch has only seven bits because it's a 15-bit register. Eight PCL bits and uh, seven high bits. And the PC latch just has seven bits to get loaded in whenever you write the PCL low. And then uh, the status register, we're only interested in the three status bits, but there are a couple of other bits that are implemented. The rest of them are not. And the status bits are Z, H, and C. Z, the Z bit for zero, the C bit for carry. The H bit was, uh, was a, uh, a BCD, binary coded decimal feature. And it tells you if there's a, if there's a carry from a, a low nibble to a high nibble. And so that, that, that sort of helps you. Okay, um, let's see. So we've talked about this, the program counter, because program memory is th has, could have up to 32K uh, and 14-bit words, uh, it's a 15-bit program counter. And uh, you can't directly write all 15 bits. You have to, you have to preload the, 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 the PC latch high with the upper seven bits. And then when you write the PCL, it dumps those in at the same time. So you get a 15-bit transfer. We have a hardware stack, 16 levels. It's not, it, it, you can get to it, but you have to use indirect addressing to get to it. But generally, it's not really something probably a programmer should get to. Uh, in, in a lot of C code, we, we do use the stack extensively. We, we, have, we create what's called a stack frame, and we store all our local variables in our stack frame. And our stack, our stack pointers, our stack itself is we located in random access memory, and we have a separate stack pointer register that that we can load in an address in random access memory, and that becomes our stack. But this is different. This is implemented in hardware. There's a, a fixed 16-bit regi uh, 16, 16 bit registers that are the stack, and that's all you get. You get no more. And if you push to the stack by doing a call or uh, interrupts uh, 16 times or on the 17th time, you'll overflow the stack and you'll be back to the beginning and you will overwrite one of your return addresses so you can never get back to where you were. And basically that'll either reset the, 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 the processor or it'll cause a major problem. Okay, so it's a Harvard machine. I've been over this, I'm not gonna belabor this. Uh, so remember data memory, 32 banks. Uh, our chip has 1K of RAM, and it's spread over the first 12 banks. Um, so, and here, here's what a typical bank looks like. Core registers, first 12 bytes. Special function register, registers, up to 20 more bytes. Uh, and then general purpose RAM. And then it, then, in the first bank, we have these registers up here, 16 at top, 70 through 7F hex, and they're mapped to every bank. So, so in the first bank, we have 80 plus 16 or 96, but in every other bank, we have a maximum of 80, plus these are mapped there, but they're not additional, they're just the same 16. And then uh, in, the, in bank 12, we only have 48, and when you add that up, uh, 80 times 12 plus 48 uh, plus 16 it equals 1024. So that's our 1K. Now, if you want to if you want to have uh, a big array, then you have to use indirect addressing, and you can address address it as a continuous block. But otherwise, you're going to have to remember that the, these first 20 20 or uh, 20 hex bytes are all going to be uh, are all going to be uh, special function and core registers in every bank. So you you know. If you wanted to go from the top of general purpose RAM to the next bank's lowest general purpose RAM, you've got this big gap in there. So, it, and and also the upper 16. So you've got, so you don't really have that contiguous uh, addressable uh, RAM uh, in assembly language without using indirect addressing. In C, you don't have to worry about it because C only uses indirect addressing anyway. Okay, uh, this was our original circuit. I actually gave uh, all the students. Uh, a voltage regulator, uh, a battery clip, um, a chip, a couple of cap, uh, a couple of one cap, I think, actually, 
one current uh, couple of resistors, a 10K pull-up and a current limiting and a LED and a, a six-pin header. And they had to uh, assemble those uh, on a little circuit board, which I will show you. Let's see if I can find it. Oh. Well, maybe I won't show you. Let me pause it for just a minute. I'll grab it. Okay, well, it took me a minute to find it. Let me, I'm going to flip this out, flip this up, and switch cameras. So here's, here was the original one. And uh, I would give the students this bag of parts with this header, the chip, the, re the two resistors, the LED, the cap, and the voltage regulator, and this little perf board. We'd glue on the parts, and then they'd have to solder them together. And you can see this one was a pretty good example of of a, this little loop was just kind of hanging by itself. These joints were just atrocious. And uh, you can see, I mean, I don't, I'm sure you can see that these leads are just, the solder job is just horrendous. Um, and some of these, and yeah, it's just unbelievable. And if, you know, obviously these were not reliable enough uh, to do labs. And they were also pretty simple. There wasn't much on them. And, and our ability to, to put on additional things was really limited. We didn't have any headers other than the programming header here. And you can see this programming header, when it got soldered on, the pins were like, uh, this pin was pushed down through. Some of the pins were up, some of the pins were down. So of course you couldn't even, this was, I, I saved this board because it was one of the, it was not a unique example. There were a lot of boards that looked this bad. Uh, and, but it was not a very, wasn't workable. So that's why I, we uh, did the printed circuit board. And I actually got my, I have the same student that did the original board. Uh, he's graduated and he still helps me uh, do these boards, Nolan Manteuffel. All right, so anyway, um, oh, let me switch myself back here. So, all right, thought you might appreciate that. Maybe not, but hopefully you do. All right, so we've come a long way. Um, and now our schematic, this is what it looks like, the schematic in Eagle. This is uh, version 3.0, but we're up to 4.3 so, or 4.4, I guess. So it's not even, so it looks even more complicated or different than this. We used to have all these headers, but now we just, we really just have the two big 10 pins and uh, the programming header and then three other, two other headers, and that's it. Okay, um, so, uh, so we get our, our integrated development environment from Microchip. Uh, it's, it doesn't cost, but our, our, in the latest version, they took out the assembler. I assume they're gonna put it back in. I, I can't imagine that's gonna fly. They still make chips that only have 300 memory locations. There's no way you can program them with the latest version of the assembler because you can't use C. There's not enough memory. Um, and then they have uh, this optimizing compiler, but the free version, and, and this XC8 is for the 8-bit chips. They have an XC16 and an XC32, I guess. Uh, and uh, they make, you know, obviously they make a whole, whole range of chips, including very powerful digital signal processing chips that are 32-bit chips, and I don't know, maybe they're even up to 64-bit chips. Uh, and then there's lots of third-party compilers uh, in BASIC, uh, in several other language languages. And I'm sure there'll be one in uh, I'm sure there'll be one in Python soon, and others. Uh, it gives us pretty good source level debugging features uh, with our SNAP or our PICKET three or our PICKET four, and there's several other. There's the ICD three, the ICD four, uh, and there's also uh, um, some other fancier debuggers and and in in circuit emulators and all sorts of stuff. Um, so. Our instruction syntax, you should know a little bit about this. We have a label field, which is the only thing that's really supposed to start in the first column uh, of our line. Uh, normally, we don't put the labels on the same line, but you certainly can. Uh, and then we have an op, op, there are op code, which is what the instruction does, and then an operand, and then maybe a second operand, or no, and then a comment. Uh, and of course, you don't have to have the comment. Uh, and some of our instructions don't have any operands. Some have one, some have two. 
And, and then we have other things like compiler assembly directors, uh, directives like bank cell. Uh, another assembler directive is org. Another assembler directive is C block where we create variables or equate or include. Uh, there's a bunch of assembler directives. Uh, and also the configuration words are also assembler directives essentially. Okay, and then we're, we've gone over these in the programming test. I'm not gonna, I'm really, that's why I do the programming test separately. I'm not gonna add that into the written. Uh, the written won't get, have any program segments. Uh, there, might be a, there might be a question about code, but there won't be very many questions about code directly. Again, that's why we do the programming test. Um, and I'm not gonna, not gonna test you on indirect addressing. Um, all right, um, so C language. Uh, so uh, with the AK program memory size we have on our chip, you can do a lot. And remember, that's a, an entire assembly language instruction at every one of the uh, 8K locations. So we don't have any instructions that take multiple locations. <laughs> okay. Um, here are some of the, uh, here are the configuration words. Now, let me go through what you should know about the configuration words. You should know that, you should know that we, we have to, we want to make our oscillator selection should be internal oscillator. Now, and this is, uh, this is C, I believe. Uh, no, maybe this is assembly. I don't, you don't have to know the difference between the C and assembly syntax. I don't even know what that is, you know, cause it's automatically generated for you. But you do need to know how to pick the settings. So oscillator, internal oscillator. Watchdog timer, off. Unless we're doing the sleep lab where we're going to turn it on or we're going to make it software selectable. Power up timer, off. Master clear, on. Code protect, code protect data, off. Brown out, you can have it on or off. Clock out enable, off. Internal external switch over, off. Fail safe clock memory, or failsafe clock monitor enable off. Uh, flash memory self write self write protection, either way. Phase lock loop enable off. Stack overflow underflow reset probably better to turn that on. Brown out reset voltage selection and uh, if you turn on brown out then you can make this high or low whichever you want. Low voltage programming enabled on. Okay, so you should you should know those. Uh, I'm not going to pimp you on all of them, but I might ask for about one or two of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I might ask you about master clear, the oscillator, low voltage programming, uh, the watchdog timer, code protect, uh, code protect data, and clock out enable. Those are the, probably the ones I'll ask. Um, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, um, so the oscillator module, you need to know a little bit about the oscillator module. You need to know that we, we, we have, if, if you don't do anything by default, I think it powers up into the 32 kilohertz mode. Uh, or something. So you do need to, if you want your chip to run a little faster, you need to pro, you need to program this the module. Uh, if you're using the internal clock. Now, if your if your configuration word set for an external clock source or for an external uh, uh, resonator or crystal, then uh, then you have to pick those selections. And then your clock's fixed based on that external reference. You don't need to you don't the internal oscillator module is not really doing anything. Uh, but in that case, you can you, then you can implement the the internal external switchover and the fail safe clock monitor so that your internal clock will take over if the external clock fails, which is kind of a cool feature. Um, all right. Um, so here are the oscillator modules, and we want to pick INTOS C, internal oscillator. And then once you in your setup part of your code, you want to initialize it so that you're at four megahertz. Not that that's a magic number. Uh, again, that it just, it's, not, it's a nice, quick, it's a fast, relatively fast clock, but it's slow enough that it doesn't uh, uh, 
cause us to have problems implementing uh, uh, servo controls and other things with our PWM channels. So the pick is fully static, which means when the clock stock stops, everything's preserved. That's why you can use your integrated debugger and you can single cycle through your program. Um, the when you when you first power up the clock, it uh, if you're using an external oscillator, the internal timer counts up to uh, 1,024 uh, every time you reset or power up before it lets the program start executing. And what this does, it that provides adequate time for the external clock to uh, to get up to clocks to you know to a stable clock, so you don't get some unpredictable behavior in the first few instruction cycles, which could be devastating. It could really cause problems because you could have your first few instructions could incorrectly execute, and then well, what would you do? Um, so we have two speed startup, uh, which allows for execution before the external clock is stable. Um, let's see. Let me uh, let me pause this. Okay, so um, okay, so let's see. Um, so the oscillator, very functional oscillator with lots of different modes. Uh, you can adjust the speed. It it is. Uh, there's all sorts of features. I I know a lot of these things. I'm not going to test you on anyway. But you should read through these. Uh, it 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 has uh, some trim registers that are set by the factory, uh, and you can adjust them over time because typically over time the the clock will slightly degrade. Um, it does have rely you know fail safe clock modes. It has uh, uh, yeah, and it's nice because you have lots of different options, so you can you can tailor the cost of your clock function uh, to spending no money on it with no external components or all sorts of other ones. Okay, well, fine, but I'm sorry. No. Oh, okay, well. Well, sorry, like I said. Okay, so <clears throat> so almost all software and large products are conducted in, with our integrated development environment. They're somewhat complex. They take time to learn, but once you learn them, they have lots of powerful features, and so it's really good for you to know that. Um, you have lots of different tools you can use. Um, uh, there are lots of, you can use you don't you can use any editor, although the built-in editor is pretty nice. You do have source level debugging. I, I do want you to know source level debugging means that you can look at your code and go through it line by line, or you can jump around or set breakpoints or, or uh, run to cursor and things like that. And you can also simulate your code. The uh, IDE has a built-in simulator. Um, your wizard will help you set up new projects. Um, your uh, the and all, each project is in its own directory. Um, the, there are assembly language templates uh, which you can use and that you can load in for both assembly and C. Um, and you do have the uh, include files and the uh, uh, and the, the the header files, which is really nice. So you can you, you have most of your definitions are already built in. Um, you can assemble it as absolute or relocatable code, so you can create modules which you can then link together in the uh, IDE uh, and link in uh, um, predefined modules that you can then call and reference. Um, you have to set up the variables as uh, as global externals and stuff like that. Um, okay, I think I'm not going to go over this. Uh, so configuration words there. Uh, here's our equate here. So this is uh, here's our we our list directive and our include file, um, and then uh, you can actually put data in your EEPROM uh, when you flash the chip. You can actually preload it with data. Um, the uh, then you your program should start at zero zero and you should put a jump there to the start uh, label, and then you should have. Uh, 
a an org at four where you would put your ISR. Uh, and you've already done that, so you know about that, both in C and in assembly. Uh, in C, they take care of that for you, but in but you have to use a special designation of interrupt uh, for your function, and you can't pass variables, and you can't return anything. Um, and then your main program, and then you have an end statement that tells the compiler that that's all there is, or the assembler. All right, I'm not going to go through this. I think we've, we've covered this in pretty good detail, and this is more for the programming test anyway. Uh, Okay, so uh, the block diagram, you should just have a rough idea. You should know separate program memory, separate modules, and random access memory. Okay, I think I'm going to stop with this. Uh, yeah, we're at 110 anyway, so I'm going to quit, and, uh, and we'll stop the recording here.